This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is Abdul Nasser Jengda and you're listening to the Qalam Podcast. Before we get started with today's session, I wanted to share a really amazing resource with you. A question that everyone has, a problem that everybody deals with is, how do I focus within my prayer? How do I enjoy my salah? Well, the answer to that question, the solution to that problem is actually quite straightforward and simple. If we understand what we say within our prayer, we'll be able to focus on it, internalize it, and actually get back to enjoying our conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We created a solution to make this possible. It's called Meaningful Prayer. This is a course, a curriculum, a seminar, a workshop that I taught in over a hundred locations all across this country and even in other countries. Tens of thousands of people have taken this course and it has really turned around, transformed their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well now, inshallah, you can take the Meaningful Prayer course online. You can take it according to your own schedule, at your own leisure. You can pace yourself. You can go back and review lessons multiple times to really be able to internalize them. Go to MeaningfulPrayer.com to sign up. Share this resource with others so that we can get back to not only just offering our prayers or performing our salah, but we can go back to experiencing a conversation and relationship with Allah. Now, to get on to today's session, inshallah, we're going to be covering the Shama'il Muhammadiyah, the prophetic personality. The following session was recorded at the Seerah Intensive. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the Shama'il Muhammadiyah, the prophetic personality. Inshallah, we're going to be continuing with uh, the chapter about the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, babu majaa fi wafati rasulillahi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is chapter number fifty-four. We're going to be starting with the twelfth hadith of the chapter, which is uh, a very lengthy narration. So as uh, we've done previously with lengthier narrations, inshallah I'll translate and explain as we go through it. قال المصنف حدثنا نصر بن علي الجهضمي قال حدثنا عبد الله بن داود قال حدثنا سلمة بن نبيت عن نعيم بن أبي هند عن نبيت بن شريط عن سالم بن عبيد وكانت له صحبة so the narration begins by mentioning a man by the name of Salib bin Ubaid, and it mentions that he is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. قال أغمي على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في مرضه فأفاقه فقال حضرة الصلاة فقالوا نعم فقال مروا بلالا فليؤذن ومروا أبا بكر أن يصلي للناس أو قال بالناس. He mentions that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became unconscious during the illness, during his illness. And this of course is referring to the illness in which, uh, that preceded the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the illness in which he passed away. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became unconscious in his illness and then he regained his consciousness and he said, is it time for the prayer? They responded by saying yes. The Prophet ﷺ then said that tell Bilal to call the Adhan and tell Abu Bakr that he should lead the people in prayer. قَالَ ثُمَّ أُغْمِيَ عَلَيْهِ فَأَفَاقَ فَقَالَ حَضْرَةِ الصَّلَاةُ فَقَالُوا نَعَمْ فَقَالَ مُرُوا بِلَالًا فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ وَمُرُوا أَبَا بَكْرٍ فَلْيُصَلِّي بِالنَّاسِ The Prophet ﷺ then once again slipped into unconsciousness and when he regained his consciousness, he once again said, he asked, is it time for the prayer? They responded by saying yes. And the Prophet ﷺ then said that, tell Bilal to call the Adhan, and tell Abu Bakr to go and lead the people in prayer. فَقَالَتْ عَائِشَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهَا إِنَّ أَبِي رَجُلٌ أَسِيفٌ إِذَا قَامَ ذَلِكَ الْمَقَامِ بَكَاءُ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُ فَلَوْ أَمَرْتَ غَيْرَهُ 
Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha then said that my father is a very soft-hearted, he is a very sentimental person. If he stands at that place, meaning the place of the Prophet ﷺ, he will cry so much that he will not be able to lead the prayer effectively. So if you may please command someone else to lead the prayer. قَالَ ثُمَّ أُغْمِيَ عَلَيْهِ فَأَفَاقَ فَقَالَ مُرُوا بِلَالًا فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ وَمُرُوا أَبَا بَكْرٍ فَلْيُصَلِّ بِالنَّاسِ Then once again the Prophet ﷺ lost consciousness. And when he regained his consciousness, the Prophet ﷺ once again said, Tell Bilal to call the Adhan and tell Abu Bakr to lead the people in prayer. فَإِنَّ كُنَّا صَوَاحِبُ يُوسُفِ أَوْ قَالَ الصَّوَاحِبَاتُ يُوسُفِ and then the Prophet ﷺ made a comment to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. He said, because you are right now acting like the women at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, what does that exactly mean? What does that comment refer to? So, many of the scholars, Ibn Hajar and Al-Bajuri and others have explained this particular comment. That what the Prophet ﷺ meant by that was that as the Imra'atul Aziz, the Qur'an tells us that the wife of the Aziz, when she had gathered the women together under the premise of you know, having a feast or having a banquet. But the real objective and the real intention was that she was going to basically present Yusuf alayhi salam. Um, and the, the whole background to this is basically that because of her um, trying to uh, seduce Yusuf alayhi salam and there were a lot of rumors following that and some of the commentary in the community that had followed after that was the fact that oh you know uh, Yusuf alayhi salam because he was sold into slavery and bought as a slave so a lot of the commentary was that um, you know she was pining after a slave etc etc um, and they were trying to criticize her for that. So what she did was she gathered the women together, as the Qur'an tells us, under the premise of sharing food. And then she presented, but the real objective was she was going to present Yusuf alayhi salam, bring out Yusuf alayhi salam, so that they could see for themselves that this wasn't just, you know, um, some ordinary uh, slave or something like that, that she was basically pining after, that this was somebody that was remarkable and unlike you know any human being that they ever they had ever witnessed before so by the prophet sallallahu saying this aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha it's like an expression it's balagha what the prophet sallallahu is saying you say one thing but you mean another you're saying one thing but you mean something else you're saying that your father is very sentimental and that's why he won't be able to lead the prayer but there's really another reason why you don't want your father to lead the prayer and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha actually talks about this herself in the narration of Sahih Bukhari where she says لَقَدْ رَاجَعْتُهُ I, you know, uh, I, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to reconsider I beseech the Prophet ﷺ to reconsider, to not make Abu Bakr lead the prayer. And she explains, وَمَا حَمَلَنِي عَلَىٰ كَثْرَةِ مُرَاجِعَتِهِ I didn't ask him once, I asked him multiple times, I repeatedly asked him, please reconsider, do not have him lead the prayer. And she says what her motivations for doing that, وَمَا حَمَلَنِي عَلَىٰ كَثْرَةِ مُرَاجِعَتِهِ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَقَعْ فِي قَلْبِي Because the reason why I kept asking him to reconsider was, I was convinced of the fact, and you يُحِبَّ النَّاسِ رَجُلًا قَامَ مَقَامَهُ أَبَدًا أَلَّا يُحِبَّ النَّاسَ رَجُلًا قَامَ مَقَامَهُ أَبَدًا She says that, I was convinced of the fact that whoever would stand in the place of the Prophet ﷺ, the people would never accept that person. Those shoes were too big to fill. Those shoes were too big to fill. Nobody could ever live up to the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. And so I was convinced that no matter who that person may be, however remarkable they may be, whoever stands in the place of the Prophet ﷺ afterwards, the people will not accept that person. وَإِلَّا كُنْتُ أَرَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يَقُومَ أَحَدْ لَنْ يَقُومَ أَيُّ أَحَدٍ مَقَامَهُ إِلَّا يَتَشَاءَمُ النَّاسُ بِهِ And I was convinced of the fact that whoever it may be that will stand in the place of the Prophet ﷺ after him, 
the people will criticize them, the people will uh, resent that person. There will almost be a type of resentment towards that person, which is a very human reaction just because they'll be struggling so much with dealing with the loss of the Prophet ﷺ that they'll just turn their ire onto the person who stands in the place of the Prophet ﷺ. And I was concerned about my father. It's her father, of course she's concerned. And so that's, that was kind of the, 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 the sentiment she had. And the Prophet ﷺ is basically, so when she's saying that he's very sentimental and he'll cry and he won't be able to stand there, the Prophet ﷺ said, well that might be true, there's another reason why you're saying what you're saying, and you're not being upfront with me. So that's what the Prophet ﷺ was alluding to with that comment. Nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ after saying that, he once again reiterated, for, of the pro, no, rather then the narration goes on to say, فَأُمِرَ بِلَالٌ فَأَذَّنْ So finally Bilal رضي الله تعالى عنه was notified and he called the Adhan. وَأُمِرَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ فَصَلَّى بِالنَّاسِ And Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه was notified and he led the people in the prayer. And the narration uh, that is found in uh, the Imam al-Dimyati, he mentions Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه ended up leading 17 prayers during those last few days of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. He led 17 prayers uh, during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And it goes on to say, ثُمَّ إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَجَدَ خِفَّةً Then after some time, a couple of days later after this, the Prophet ﷺ found, you know, the, he, he found that his... Khifatan, like his burden had been lifted a bit. Basically what that means is, the Prophet ﷺ felt lighter. He felt a bit better. It's a way to say that he felt better. Felt lighter, meaning he felt better. قَالَ فَانْدُرُوا قَالَ أُنْدُرُوا لِي مَنْ أَتَّكِئُ عَلَيْهِ He said, please go and find someone for me that I can lean on so that I can go to the prayer. Like I can lean on them and they can help me go for the prayer. فَجَاءَتْ بَرِيرَةُ وَرَجُلٌ آخر. So then the narration mentions that Barira رضي الله تعالى عنه this was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He and another man, they came. And the Prophet ﷺ basically went to the prayer leaning on the two of them. So Barira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and another companion came and the Prophet ﷺ leaned on both of them, kind of put his arms around their shoulders to be able to go to the prayer. Now when you look in the narration itself, the narrations of Bukhari and Muslim and other narrations as well, uh, Daru Qutni, Sahih Muslim, uh, a number of different narrations, even in the Sahih of Ibn Hibban, there's a lot of different names of different companions who helped the Prophet ﷺ go to the prayer. One narration found in Bukhari and Muslim says it was Abbas and Ali. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Another narration in Sahih Muslim says it was Abbas and his son Al-Fadl. Another narration mentions it was Abbas and Usama ibn Zayd. Usama the son of Zayd bin Haritha. The narration of Daru Qutni says it was Usama and Al-Fadl, the son of Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. And the narration of Sahih uh, ibn Hibban says it was Barira, and the other person's name was Nauba. Now, the question here is, is that, so which two were, was it? So, the answer to that is, that the Prophet ﷺ, for multiple prayers when he went, he required physical assistance to be able to go to the prayer. And so for different prayers, it was all these different individuals. On one occasion, it was Abbas and Ali. On another occasion, it was Usama and Fadl. On another occasion, the one that this is mentioning, it was Barira and Noba. <coughs> Proceeding forward, فَلَمَّا رَآهُ أَبُو بَكْرٍ ذَهَبَ لِيَنْكُسَ فَأَوْمَأَ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يَثْبُتَ مَكَانَهُ When Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu became aware that the Prophet ﷺ had entered the premises, he had entered the masjid, then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu started to recede, he started to move back. And the Prophet ﷺ with his hand gestured to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that stay in your place. حَتَّى قَضَى أَبُو بَكْرٍ صَلَاتَهُ And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu concluded the prayer. ثُمَّ إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ قُبِضَ And thereafter, after some time had passed, it's basically moving forward, the Prophet ﷺ eventually passed away. فَقَالَ عُمَرْ عُمَرْ رضي الله تعالى عنه said, وَاللَّهِ لَا أَسْمَعُ أَحَدًا يَذْكُرُ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ قُبِضَ إِلَّا ضَرَبْتُهُ بِسَيْفِي هَذَا 
Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that I swear to God, if I hear anyone mention the fact that the Prophet sallallahu has passed, I will strike them down with my sword. Qala wa kana nasu, and this is commentary from Salim, the Sahabi who's narrating this, Salim bin Ubaid, he makes a very interesting observation, he makes a very astute observation. Look at the analysis of Salim. He says, wa kana nasu ummiyina. He said that the Arabs that the Prophet ﷺ had come to, who were the majority of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they were an illiterate, unlettered people. And specifically what he means by Ummiyun here is that they were not people of the book. They were not people of the book. They were not Christians and Jews. The vast overwhelming majority of them were mushrik before Islam. And so Islam was the first time that they were actually um, you know, practicing a religion that was based on some type of prophetic heavenly scripture or prophetic teaching. All right? لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِمْ نَبِيٌّ قَبْلَهُ They had never believed in a Prophet before the Prophet ﷺ. فَأَمْسَكَ النَّاسُ So the people were all quiet. It, meaning in the aftermath of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, everyone was just kind of like frozen. Everyone was just kind of quiet. Nobody really knew what to do. Everyone was just kind of stuck. فَأَمْسَكَ النَّاسُ فَقَالُوا يَا سَالِمْ that he says that some of the people there said to him, they addressed him, O Salim, in taliq ila sahibi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, fadu'uhu. They said that, O Salim, I, excuse me, I wanted to mention something, I almost forgot about this. When he says, وَكَانَ النَّاسُ أُمِّيِّينَ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِمْ نَبِيٌّ قَبْلَهُ What he's actually saying is that because they, the only way you would know what to do in the case of the passing of a prophet is one of two ways. Either you had witnessed the passing of a prophet before, or number two, you had read about it in some type of teachings of religion that this is what you do when a prophet passes. And because they had not practiced, they were not Christians and Jews, they were not Ahlul Kitab, it's not like they had read about this anywhere, that what did the previous nations used to do when their prophets would pass away. And because there had never been a prophet amongst them before, they had never believed in a prophet before, they had never experienced this. So he's basically referring to the fact, this was the, the analysis, that there are two ways to acquire knowledge, either through learning or, or through experience. Knowledge is either learned or experiential, right? Anecdotal. And they had neither advantage. So that's why he's saying that the people were just stuck. They didn't know what to do. Nevertheless, now moving forward, he says that the people said, O oh, Salim, go to the friend of the Prophet ﷺ. Sahibi Rasulullah ﷺ. Go to the, the, the constant companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Fad'uhu. And please bring him. And of course, who are they referring to? He says, Fa'adaytu Aba Bakrin. So I went to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wa huwa fil masjid, he was already in the masjid, فَأَتَيْتُهُ abki dahishan. And he says, when I approached him, I was crying uncontrollably. فَلَمَّا رَآنِي, when he saw me, he said, أَقُبِدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. The Prophet ﷺ has passed. قُلْتُ إِنَّ عُمَرْ I said, of course, but he responds by just, you know, telling him the situation. He says, Umar, يَقُولُ لَا أَسْمَعُ أَحَدًا يَذْكُرُ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ قُبِدَ إِلَّا ضَرَبْتُهُ بِسَيْفِ هَذَا He says, Umar is saying that uh, I, if I hear anyone mentioning that the Prophet ﷺ has passed, I will strike them down with my sword. فَقَالَ لِي إِنْطَلِقْ فَانْطَلَقْتُ مَعَهُ he, he says that Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه said to me, he said, come, let's go. So I went with him. فَجَاءَ وَالنَّاسُ قَدْ دَخَلُوا عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. When he came upon the home of Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها, the apartment of Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها, many people had already packed into the apartment. To just basically, they were just stunned. They were just standing there, just staring. They were stunned. فَقَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ أَفْرِجُوا لِي Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه came in and he said, Oh people, make way. Make way, move out of the way. فَأَفْرَجُوا لَهُ فَجَاءً فَأَفْرَجُوا لَهُ فَجَاءً حَتَّى أَكَبَّ عَلَيْهِ وَمَسَّهُ They moved out of the way and Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه approached the body of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and then basically he kissed the forehead of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as we read about earlier. فَقَالَ إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ He recited the ayah of the Qur'an that certainly you shall pass and they will pass as well one day. ثُمَّ قَالُوا 
Then they said, the people who were there, they said, Ya sahiba Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aqubida Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, O oh, friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has he truly passed away? Is he gone? Qala na'am, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, yes, he is truly gone. Fa'alimu an qad sadaqa. And they knew that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is always truthful and honest with the people. قالوا يا صاحب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أي يصلى على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال نعم then they said oh friend of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم are we supposed to pray upon the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم like are we supposed to have some type of janaza proceeding and he said yes قالوا وكيف they said well how should it be قال يدخل قوم فيكبرون ويصلون ويدعون ثم يخرجون ثم يدخل قوم فيكبرون ويصلون ويدعون ثم يخرجون حتى يدخل يدخل الناس he said that a group of people however many can fit into the apartment at one time should come in and they should basically say Allahu Akbar they should send peace and blessings upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they should make dua to Allah and then they should exit and another group should come in, should enter, perform the same procedure and exit. And another group should come in and perform the same procedure and exit. This is how it will be done. قَالُوا يَا صَاحِبَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَيُّدْفَنُوا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ قَالَ نَعَمْ Then they asked, O friend of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, is, should the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, should he be laid to rest? Should he be buried in the ground? And he answered, he said, yes. قَالُوا أَيْنَ They said, where we, should we bury him? قَالَ فِي الْمَكَانِ الَّذِي قَبَضَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ رُوحَهُ He should be buried in the same exact place where his soul departed his body. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَقْبِضْ رُوحَهُ إِلَّا فِي مَكَانٍ طَيِّبٍ Because God only takes the soul of a prophet away in a blessed place, on blessed land. فَعَلِمُوا أَنْ قَدْ صَدَقَ And they knew that Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه is always truthful and honest. ثُمَّ أَمْرَهُمْ أَنْ يُغَسِّلَهُ بَنُوا أَبِيهِ Then Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه said that the relatives, the male relatives of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم from his father's side of the family because those are the folks that are oftentimes referred to as the awliya of a person. Those who are from the tribe of one's father, like the father's side of the family. It might be a father, a grandfather, uncle, brothers, cousins. Those are referred to as the awliya of a person. So the, he, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that those should be the individuals who bathe the family of, uh, the, the, bathe the body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and those were of course people like Abdullah bin Abbas, Fadl bin Abbas, and others. وَجْسَمَعَ الْمُهَاجِرُونَ يَتَشَاوَرُونَ then it kind of fast forwards a little bit. It says that after all of this was taken care of, the muhajirun, the Makkan Muslims, they congregated, they gathered together to consult with one another. And what's being implied here is they were consulting that how will the affairs of the Muslims be managed going forward from here? How will the affairs of the Muslims be managed going forward from here? فَقَالُوا إِن تَلِقْ بِنَا إِلَىٰ إِخْوَانِنَا مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ نُدْخِلُهُمْ مَعَنَا فِي هَذَا الْأَمْرِ After they spoke for some time, they said, let us go and visit and consult our brothers from amongst the Medinan Muslims, the Ansar, the helpers of Medina, and we should enter them into this discussion in trying to figure out how to conduct and manage the affairs of the Muslims going forward. فَقَالَتِ الْأَنصَارِ Some of the Ansar had a suggestion. They said, minna أَمِيرٌ وَمِنْكُمْ أَمِيرٌ We will have a, a leader, a governor, somebody to you know, lead from amongst us. And you, O Muhajirun, will have someone to lead from amongst you. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu at that time commented, and part of the premise, more lengthier narrations, he basically presents to them the, 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 the logical fallacy therein, that in having two leaders, it will inevitably result in some type of conflict, that we need to have unified leadership. And then he furthermore then makes the case for that unified leadership by saying, مَنْ لَهُ مِثْلُ هَذِهِ الثَّلَاثِ 
ثاني اثنين اذ هما في الغار اذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن ان الله معنا he says that where else will you find these three distinctions that are present in the verse of the Quran where God, where Allah says that the second of the two who were in the cave when he said to his travel companion do not grieve for Allah is constantly with us. Can you find me another person that has three distinctions of this caliber? What are the three distinctions? Then it's explained. The first distinction is ثاني اثنين إذهما في الغار. The second of the two when they were in the cave, and that is Allah subhanahu wa taala acknowledging, as the scholars explain, this is Allah subhanahu wa taala acknowledging the sacrifices, the devotion, the dedication of Abu Bakr radiallahu taala anhu, that he stayed with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through thick and thin. He was the one to be with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when there only could be one other person with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that was stashed away in the cave of Thod during the migration while people were hunting them down. Number one, that's the first distinction. God recognizes that distinction of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The second was, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ The Qur'an says, the Qur'an calls Abu Bakr the best friend of the Prophet ﷺ. When he said to his best friend, sahibihi. So the Qur'an, Allah says, Abu Bakr is Muhammad's best friend. Because that's how he alludes to him, that's how he identifies him. And then the third one is لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Do not grieve, do not be sad, because Allah is constantly with us. With not not just me, the Prophet ﷺ said, He is with us. And basically, what he's pointing out here is just as the help of Allah subhanahu wa taala was always with the Prophet ﷺ, this verse shows that similarly, the Prophet ﷺ was basically acknowledging that the help of Allah will always be with Abu Bakr. Because he said, Allah is with us. Alright? So he says that, do you have anyone else who has these, these three distinctions? Such great three distinctions. Manhuma, Show me. Where else you can find, you know, a second person of this caliber? And of course, everyone recognized exactly what he was talking about. Everyone accepted what Abu Bakr, what Umar radiallahu ta'ala was presenting. Thumma basata yadahu. Then um, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu basically put his hand in the hand of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu فَبَايَعَهُ And he gave him the oath of allegiance that you are our leader. وَبَايَعَهُ النَّاسُ بَيْعَةً حَسَنَةً جَمِيلَةً And all the rest of the people, all the rest of the companions basically came forth and gave the oath of allegiance, a very beautiful, a very remarkable oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, thereby maintaining the unity of the community of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a very lengthy narration which tells us a lot about, you know, the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what transpired therein, and how difficult of a moment it was, and how the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, um, they basically survived this great tragedy. We read the narration earlier where the Sahaba say that the day the Prophet ﷺ arrived was the most beautiful day. And the day that he passed away was the most tragic day. And in the narrations that we're going to read next, we'll also see the Prophet ﷺ also talking about, and we'll also read more about the, how, what a tragedy the passing of the Prophet ﷺ was. قال المصنف حدثنا نصر بن علي قال حدثنا عبد الله بن الزبير شيخ باهلي قديم بصري قال حدثنا ثابت ثابت البناني عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه قال لما وجد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من كرب الموت ما وجد قالت فاطمة رضي الله تعالى عنها وكرباه فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا كرب على أبيك بعد اليوم إنه قد حضر من أبيك ما ليس بتارك منه أحدا الموافاة يوم القيامة in this narration, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started to experience the difficulty of passing that he experienced, 
Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the beloved daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, wa karabahu, in another narration of Sahih Bukhari, she says, wa karaba abah, right? That basically the same thing, meaning that, oh, the suffering of my father. Like, why does my dad have to suffer so? The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard her say this, he said, لا كرب على أبيك بعد اليوم Worry not that your father will not suffer anymore after today. And then he goes on to say that because the difficulty that has come upon your father now is something that will come upon each and every single person until the day of judgment, until the day of resurrection. Meaning death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ This is the Prophet ﷺ referencing the ayah that every single soul, every single person, every single living thing tastes death. Will depart, has to depart, must depart. And no one is exempted from this. No one is excused from this. In the next narration, قال المصنف حدثنا أبو الخطاب زياد بن يحيى البصري ونصر بن علي قال حدثنا عبد ربه ابن بارق الحنفي قال سمعت جدي أبا أمي سماك بن الوليد يحدث أنه سمع ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما يحدث أنه سمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من كان له فرطان من أمتي أدخله الله تعالى بهما الجنة فقالت عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها من كان له فرط من أمتك قال ومن كان له فرط يا موفقة قالت فمن, لك فمن لم يكن له فرط من أمتك قال فأنا فرط لأمتي لن يصابوا بمثلي In this narration Anas uh, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says that I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that whosoever from my ummah, anyone from my ummah who suffers the loss of two children, who suffers the loss of two children, someone who has two children that die, that pass away. Basically, farat refers to um, a child before attaining the age of uh, puberty, the age of adulthood, adolescence. That this basically the person is, the child is referred to as farat, as in the dua of the denaza as well, Allahumma ja'alhu lana faratan. Basically because that child precedes the parents, and that is not the norm. Normally the parents precede the child. Right? Parents do not survive the child in death. It's the other way around. Children survive their parents. But because in that Scenario and in that case, the parents end up surviving the child. The child moves ahead of the parents in that sense to the hereafter, to the afterlife. The child is referred to as farat. And so the Prophet ﷺ is saying that anyone from my ummah who suffers a loss of two children, Allah will enter them into paradise because of the loss of those two children. Because of how agonizing, how painful, and how difficult it is. That someone who can survive that, Allah guarantees in paradise. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she asks, when she hears the Prophet say this, well what about someone who loses one child? Right? She's asking a question, but it's her way to basically ask, that Ya Rasulullah, Messenger of God. It's not like losing one child is easy. So what about somebody who has lost one child? And the Prophet ﷺ says, وَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ فَرَطٌ He says, even if someone lost just one child, yes, they are also guaranteed paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, يَا muwaffaqa." يَا muwaffaqa means that muwaffaqa comes from tawfiq and it basically is a way to compliment someone to basically say that you are truly guided by Allah. You are truly guided by Allah. That you are blessed by Allah with sound intellect. With a good question. I answer afterwards. That that's a way to congratulate someone. Ya muwaffaqa, ya muwaffaq. May Allah bless you, may God bless you. That is a beautiful question. So the Prophet ﷺ compliments her by basically saying that, what a beautiful question. 
And this is something the Prophet ﷺ used to always appreciate. When people would ask questions that would create more mercy, that would create more facilitation, that would accommodate more people in virtue and reward and in mercy, the Prophet ﷺ used to be very appreciative of this. Because the Prophet ﷺ saw this as someone understanding the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ. That extend mercy as much as you can. So the Prophet ﷺ says, yes, even if someone has lost just one child. And then she asks, that a messenger of Allah, what if somebody did not lose any child? You know, somebody did not lose a child in childhood, like a young child. But that's not to say that people have still not, you know, gone through a lot. What about those folks? Can you please share some virtue, some reward for them? And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, فَأَنَا فَرَاتٌ لِأُمَّتِي I, meaning my loss, will be that tragedy for my ummah, and the Prophet ﷺ, that they will be rewarded for. And the Prophet ﷺ says, لَن يُصَابُوا بِمِثْلِي لَن يُصَابُوا بِمِثْلِي That nobody, the people will never suffer a loss like my loss to them. The greatest loss that will ever be afflicted upon this ummah is the loss of its Prophet, the loss of its Messenger. And this was not, God forbid, of course not, it's, it's beyond even comprehension, it's beyond even fathoming it. But this was not the Prophet ﷺ basically, you know, self-complimenting or bragging about himself. He's just stating the fact. There's nothing more tragic than losing a Prophet. Any Prophet. There's nothing more tragic than losing a Messenger. Any Messenger. So that's what the Prophet ﷺ is complimenting, that the great, the, that's what the Prophet ﷺ is commenting, that the greatest tragedy that will ever befall uh, the people will be the loss of a Prophet. And since he is the last and the finality of Prophets, he says, my loss will be the great tragedy of my people. And that's why um, some of the scholars mention some very interesting things. Uh, there's a narration in Ibn Majah, where the Prophet ﷺ, he said when he was ill right before he passed, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ أُصِيبَ بِمُصِيبَةٍ فَلْيَتَّعِزْ بِمُصِيبَتِهِ فِيَّ عَنِ الْمُصِيبَةِ الَّتِي تُصِيبُهُ بَعْدِي فَإِنَّ أَحَدًا مِنْ أُمَّتِي لَنْ يُصَابَ بِمُصِيبَةٍ بَعْدِي أَشَدَّ عَلَيَّ مِنْ مُصِيبَتِي The Prophet ﷺ said that anyone whenever they go through any type of difficulty should really reflect upon the tragedy of losing its prophet and losing its messenger. Losing their prophet, losing their messenger. Because he said that nobody will ever suffer a tragedy that will, after me that will be greater than the loss of the prophet and the messenger. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullahu ta'ala, he mentions that it became a part of the tradition of Medina. It became a part of the tradition of Medina. It was a part of the culture of Medina. كَانَ رَجُلُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُ مُصِيبَةٌ That whenever anybody suffered some type of loss in Medina, in the community of Medina, جَاءَ أَخُوهُ فَصَافَحَهُ That somebody would come to them and you know greet them and meet them, console them, and they would say, يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ إِتَّقِ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That they used to tell them that, Oh my brother, oh slave of Allah, be mindful of God in your tragedy, because verily within the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, certainly within the Messenger of God sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there is the ultimate role model. And what he meant by that was two things. Number one, that remember the losses that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi suffered. He lost his father. He lost his mother. He lost his grandfather. He lost his wife. He lost six of his children. So yes, you have suffered a great loss and we acknowledge that, but no find strength in the example of the Prophet ﷺ. And the second thing that they would mean by that is also, that remember, we are the people, we are the community that suffered the loss of the Prophet ﷺ. We can survive anything. If we survived the departure of the Prophet ﷺ, we can survive anything. So this was something um, very, very beautiful. In another narration of Sahih Muslim, it's mentioned, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِأُمَّةٍ خَيْرًا قُبِضَ نَبِيُّهَا قَبْلَهَا A sign of the blessedness of a people is that their Prophet passes while they are still alive. That the people continue and the Prophet passes and the people continue. فَجَعَلَهُ لَهَا فَرَطًا وَسَلَفًا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهَا And that Prophet proceeds forward ahead of them and that Prophet basically will vouch for them and intercede for them. 
وَإِذَا أَرَادَ هَلَاكَ أُمَّةٍ عَذَّبَهَا وَنَبِيُّهَا حَيٌّ And the sign of the tragedy, the sign of the tragedy of an ummah, like the sign that a people are ruined, is when the people perish and the Prophet is still alive. Because that obviously means that they were destroyed. That obviously means that they were destroyed. Look at the people of Ad, they, they were destroyed, and Hud alayhi salam was still alive. The people of Thamud were destroyed, and Salih alayhi salam was still alive. All these nations the Quran tells us about. But the Prophet ﷺ left this world, and we are still here till today. This is a sign of the blessing of this ummah. That we will carry on the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. And we will carry on the task of the Prophet ﷺ. And we will benefit from the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ in the life of the hereafter, bi ta'ala. Um, inshallah, that concludes this particular chapter. Um, today will be a bit of a shorter session, um, because I wanted to leave the new chapter for uh, the entirety of the session, inshallah. Um, before everyone um, kind of disperses, before we conclude and we finish here, what I wanted to share was one particular thing, and we're going to be talking about this as I had mentioned uh, before, you know, on the, obviously the last day of the class, when we talk about the passing of the Prophet wasallam, the final days of the Messenger wasallam. However, however, um, the thing I wanted to share is that one of the narrations that we'll talk about there, that we'll cover is in those final moments of the life of the Prophet Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, we learned a narration where she was holding the Prophet Wasallam in her arms, in her lap. And while she was holding him there and she was waiting, you know, she was just basically comforting him, her brother, uh, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he entered the room just to kind of check on her and see if she required any assistance. He had a siwak, Right? And the siwak was basically, essentially kind of a, a toothbrush, if you will. Um, but it was particularly carved from, it was the branch of the tree of Iraq. Um, and what would be done with that is that you cut it and they basically, you kind of peel the end of it, you kind of chew it up and loosen the bristles, and that would serve as a type of kind of a toothbrush. And that was a beautiful sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He used to do that even while he was fasting. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, I couldn't even count how many days, how many times he would do it during the, even the days of Ramadan. He constantly did that. When he made wudu, before he prayed, when he entered his home, all the time. And so she says that the Prophet ﷺ, he couldn't talk. And he pointed at the siwak, the new siwak, the new branch that was sticking out of Abdurrahman's pocket. And I knew that he wanted to do the siwak. Because he always did it before he, before he prayed, meaning before he spoke to Allah. And so he pointed at it, and I asked my brother to give it to me. And she then mentions about how the Prophet ﷺ, due to his uh, illness, how weak he was at that moment, I knew that he wouldn't be able to chew it up to loosen the bristles, so I kind of chewed it up and loosened it up. And then in one narration she says, I kind of... You know, did brush the teeth of the, the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. And in one narration, he put his hand on there as well. And this was one of the final things the Prophet ﷺ did before departing from this world, before speaking the words, Allahumma rafiq ilala, and departing the world. Um, and inshallah, like I said, we'll talk more about this uh, in its entire narrative when we get to that particular moment. But um, I just wanted to share it. And you know, the we've talked about this a little bit, even in the Q&A session that we had. There's the fit of things, and then there is the spirituality of things. Okay? So purely from a fiqh perspective, a legal perspective, any type of cleansing of one's mouth, or any utensil that allows one to clean one's mouth, like a toothbrush, basically will fulfill that basic requisite of cleanliness. The oral hygiene the Prophet ﷺ used to maintain. So people ask the question, what about brushing your teeth? What about using a toothbrush? Absolutely, that fulfills that requisite. However, what that does not still take away from and what does that still not change is that in emulating uh, the Prophet ﷺ and acquiring and utilizing the siwak particularly as a gesture of love towards the Prophet ﷺ, that is a gesture of love. That is something very personal. That is something the person is rewarded for.